Good morning and welcome to our plenary session. Today uh, we'll be talking about the Biden border crisis. Um, my name is John Hostetler. Uh, I am the Vice President of Federal Affairs for States Trust, the federal arm of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. In a previous life, I served six terms in the United States House of Representatives from 1995 to 2007, where I was chairman of the Subcommittee on Immigration, Border Security, and Claims of the House Judiciary Committee for two of those terms. I want to welcome you to our discussion uh, of the, the crisis at the border. Uh, in 2019, uh, a few months after I started at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, we stood up our Right on Immigration initiative, uh, currently headed by our senior director of Right on Immigration, uh, Ken Oliver. Uh, when we started the, the uh, uh, initiative, having just started at the state's trust uh, presence in Washington, D.C. in late 2018, we, uh, we said we were going to focus on border security first. The, the initiative is Right on Immigration. But, but first, we have to secure the border. We, we, we were not first to this discussion in Washington, D.C. There are a lot of people that had been there decades before us. Uh, and when we said we were going to stress border security uh, and, and not initially talk about all of the other tremendous concerns in the immigration policy sphere, we got some, we got some blowback, you might say, in D.C. Uh, parlance. Uh, but, but we have stayed the course uh, under Ken's leadership uh, where today we have a border security coalition of individuals across the right of center uh, uh, sphere, if you will, on a host of issues that are likewise committed to securing the border first. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And, and as it happens, uh, we're in a situation where this discussion uh, is gaining, has gained tremendous attention as the result of the, the dereliction of this current administration. Now, with us today, we are blessed to have two individuals who are on the uh, cutting edge of, of border security discussion, as well as implementation and future implementation. First of all, Representative Brian Babin was sworn into the 114th Congress on June 6, 2015. As a lifelong resident of East Texas, he proudly serves the people of Texas's 36th congressional district, including the counties of Chambers, Liberty, Hardin, Tyler, Jasper, and Newton, as well as portions of Jefferson and southeastern Harris counties. Congressman Babin was born in Port Arthur and grew up in Beaumont. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science from Lamar University and completed dental school at the University of Texas Dental Branch in Houston, Texas. He and his wife, Roxanne, were married in 1972. The congressman served as an airborne artilleryman in the U.S. Army Reserve and in the Texas Army National Guard. After being stationed overseas with the U.S. Air Force, he and Roxanne settled in Woodville, Texas, where he owned and operated a dental office for 35 years. As a member of Congress, Representative Babin is in his fifth term and serves on the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, as well as the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee, where he chairs the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee. These assignments provide him with a critical platform to serve the economic needs of the 36th Congressional District, home to NASA's Johnson Space Center, four deep water ports, and numerous oil and gas refineries. Congressman Babin is also co-chair of the House Border Security Caucus. He and Roxanne have five children and 17 grandchildren, making America safe, strong, and economically secure for the future of his children and grandchildren remains his reason for serving in Congress and proudly serving the people of Texas 36. Please help me in welcoming Congressman Brian Babbitt. Thank you. Next, the Honorable Rodney Scott, prior to joining Texas Public Policy Foundation in the fall of 2021, Rodney Scott served as the 24th Chief of the United States Border Patrol excelling in that capacity during both of the administrations of President Donald J. Trump and President Joseph R. Biden, Jr. Prior to his elevation to chief, Rodney's past assignments included serving as chief patrol agent of the San Diego and El Centro sectors in California, assistant chief in U.S. Customs and Border Protection's Office of Anti-Terrorism, and director of the Incident Management and Operations Coordination Division 
at CBP headquarters in Washington, D.C. Throughout his entire career protecting our union's borders, Chief Scott was not a political appointee, but a career public servant. The servant leadership that has characterized Chief Scott's life continues today as TPPF's senior distinguished fellow for border security. In his capacity here, Chief Scott provides America's leading state-based think tank with analysis and recommendations on both federal, state, and local border security efforts. Thank you, Chief Scott, for being here and help me, welcoming, help me welcome Chief Scott. Thank you. We'll start the discussion this morning uh, with a question to, to you, Chief Scott. Uh, from your perspective as Border Patrol Chief, before, during, and after the transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, tell us why we've gone from a border that was largely secured to the current situation where we recently experienced the largest monthly number of encounters between the ports of entry in the history of Border Patrol at the southern border. So you hit the nail on the head, it has changed uh, significantly. And if I had to summarize it in just a few short words, it would be re-implementing catch and release. So every administration, not just the Trump administration, every administration uh, that I worked for prior, and I was an agent under six different administrations, always focused on trying to make sure there was a consequence to illegal activity. So when I say catch and release, think about what you're hearing in normal cities or some cities around the country about uh, no cash bond or basically being released with, with no type of bail. It's the same concept. So catch and release, which this administration very, very intentionally re-implemented, means that people, a vast majority of the illegal aliens coming across the border get caught, processed, and then released into the United States. So we give them the prize they wanted. Well, they called home and told people, hey, yeah, it's not just on TV, it's real. And then the second wave came. And then that cartels have learned how to use those people to their advantage now. And now the cartels, unfortunately, control the border instead of us. But it really comes down to consequences for illegal activity. And this administration took them away. Uh, what about a couple of specifics other than catch and release that the administration put in place or stopped uh, having in place has led to this? So there's multiple steps everybody's probably heard, unless you live in a cave, about a border wall. So when the administration shut that off, some of it was the signaling, the messaging that went worldwide that, hey, the, we're, we're literally stopping construction of this wall. That sent a message to the world that our borders are open. But probably uh, what most people need to understand is that actually made every single border patrol agent out there less effective. So the border wall infrastructure, and it was a system, it was actually a smart wall, it never gets any attention, but there's a ton of technology being installed with it as well. It allowed every single border patrol agent to cover a much broader or more miles of border, but it also took away the ability for, for the cartels uh, to, do, to fake a play, if you will, to very quickly push over some people in front of you, you get busy, and then they run the narcotics or whatever behind you. The wall having a barrier to slow people down actually really Im Im impeded their ability to do that. And there was a huge return on the investment there. But th when I talk about consequences, uh, there was programs you probably heard about, migrant protection protocols, remain in Mexico. All that really meant, it gets overly complicated in the news, all that really meant was if someone came to the US and you are gonna claim asylum, we're gonna give you a day in court, but you get to wait outside the country, and normally in Mexico, until you get your day in court. The day that your court, on the day you're supposed to go to court, we'll pick you up at the border, take you to the courthouse. If the judge says you can stay, congratulations. If he says you go home, then you go home. 80 to 90 percent of the asylum claims are fraud. They do not meet the merits of the United States. So as soon as people realized they couldn't defeat the system, they literally went home. And that cleaned up a lot of the clutter on the border. The other, the other piece of it was a, a, what we call asylum cooperative agreements. We were making uh, agreements with other nations throughout the hemisphere to make the entire hemisphere safe, but we removed the ability to what, do what we call nation shopping. We basically, if you came and you claimed asylum, you were afraid of Guatemala, then we would find another safe country, and we were building out a list so we could say, well, what about Honduras? What about El Salvador? What about Mexico? But that you couldn't just say, hey, yeah, I'm afraid of something in, in this country, but I'm gonna look at all the countries in the world and pick the one I wanna to go to. That's not how asylum's supposed to work. So we took that ability away. 
The Biden administration shut all those off immediately, along with the very public messaging that our borders are open. Uh, and then you can see the results today. 2.2 million encounters by U.S. Border Patrol in fiscal year 22. 98 people on the national terrorist watch list in those encounters. But don't get too distracted by that. that those massive numbers, just think of the man hours it takes to process those. What that did was it overwhelmed all the Border Patrol agents and left hundreds of miles of border completely wide open. South Texas does not have a lot of technology along the border. That was shut off when the border wall construction was shut off. So now you have hundreds of miles of border. We have no idea what crossed. That's what should worry you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Congressman Babin, as a result of the midterms last November, the Republican Party has taken majority control of the House of Representatives. From personal experience, I can say that the previous Republican minority in the House, in which you previously served, took an unprecedented position when it made border security a top priority in your conference's commitment to America. Could you tell us how the House GOP came to the conclusion that you were going to officially declare border security a top priority, and how likely it is that the House GOP will follow through on efforts to secure the border, understanding the caveat that the Senate is in another party's hands in the White House likewise? Thank you, John. Good question. Uh, it, it, it's not hard, because as you, you just heard uh, Chief uh, Scott talking, uh, this border has become a, uh, a humanitarian disaster, the worst in the history of our nation. And uh, you, you cannot ignore the fact that millions and millions of people are coming across the border freely being processed in, basically erasing our border. Uh, we've got, a, we've got a, uh, an, an administration that simply is bent upon facilitating and processing people into our country and ignoring the laws uh, that are already on the books. And this is a, uh, a, a this is not just a GOP, uh, you know, uh, plan that we have because there are now a number of, of my own colleagues who are Democrats on the other side that know full well uh, the, da the dangers and the damage. And when you were, you were given, uh, you know, introducing me and my, my, my resume, uh, you know, I serve on space, science, and technology, and transportation and infrastructure. And you're thinking, well, what, what, is, what, is, uh, what does Congressman Babin really have to do with, with, with border issues? Before I ever even got to Congress, I was looking at this border and realizing the extreme danger. You don't have to go any further than to look at, at visa overstayers, people like this that, that attacked and gave us 9-11. Uh, this border, I think, presents uh, a, a, uh, a threat to the freedom, the sovereignty, uh, the solvency, and security of the United States like nothing else. Uh, we certainly have foreign adversaries, and guess what? They play right into this border issue as well, because where's this fentanyl coming from? China. It's coming in from China, going through Mexico, fabricate, a lot of it's being fabricated uh, from, from ingredients coming from China. The northern, and this is the southern border, the northern border, illegal crossings are up 800%, 800% up there. And I think Ronnie could probably give us his perspective on, on something like that. But, but the, the criminality, the, the danger to it being uh, of exposing so many Americans to uh, criminality, terrorism, drugs, public health. I'm a, I'm a health care provider. Uh, this is one of the most important things, if not the most threatening thing to uh, America that I think that there really is. And that's why I've, I've uh, made this a, a real, real uh, focus of my uh, congressional activities, and that's on the border. We know we only have a five-seat majority in the House of Representatives, John. You've served there. You know a five-seat majority is not much. It's pretty thin. We did not win the, the U.S. Senate. We don't have a friend in the White House. And uh, so we have a challenge ahead of us. Uh, but I can tell you that we have a commitment to America uh, plan that, that all of our leadership in the conference, uh, from the speaker and, and the majority leader, the whip on down, uh, are bent upon delivering uh, kind of like what we had uh, back in, 90, in, in 1994 
uh, when we had the contract for America. And then we weren't content, or those of us in, in the state of Texas, my, my, I'm very proud to be serving with some very able men and women on the Republican side uh, in the great state of Texas. There's 25 of us, and we have our own Texas plan. It's very similar to the Commitment for America, and I served on that task force uh, for the Commitment uh, for America, but our, our state plan, uh, Texas border plan, I think is an extremely uh, good one that we should follow and try to implement any way we possibly can. Again, our challenges are there, but you know, we control the purse strings, and quite frankly, I'll mention some of the Democrats that are now, uh, they realized the, uh, I think they realized it before, but I think they, they actually were kind of under the heel of a very, very repressive uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, as, as Speaker of the House of Representatives, because so many of them that voted with her 100% of the time are now voting with us on some of these issues the last few weeks since we've taken the, taken the majority. Uh, so the chaos, the crime, the deaths, 100,000 plus Americans every single year dying of, of drug overdoses coming across that southern border. Uh, these are the kinds of things that I think galvanize people. And, you know, that's why it's so valuable that, that, that you, you know, uh, TPPF and other associations and organizations are to get the word out to the American people because I hate to say this, but much, a huge percentage of our, of our, our, our national media simply does not cover what is transpiring at the border, the deaths, the destruction, the rape, the child molestation, the, the human sex trade, the complete taking over of our border, as Rodney uh, said, by the drug cartels, the, the, the Mexican drug cartels, and they're really international now, uh, they control everything down there. Nobody comes across that border without paying the drug cartels. And uh, if you don't, you pay the piper with your life. And they also keep a leash on the people that come in and, and still owe them money. They go to work for people around this country. You think slavery is over? I hate to tell you, it's still alive and well right here in America. And child sex, the sex rings, the sex trade, it's alive and well. I personally have toured as the, as the Border Security Caucus co-chair bringing uh, uh, congressional delegations down there, question and ask HHS personnel, other uh, personnel that's on the border, who bragged that they were taking really good care of these children, these UACs, unaccompanied children, and that they were reuniting them with their families around the country. I said, well, do you do a, a, do you do a, a DNA test? Are you certain that they're going to their families? Oh, no, we don't do that. Are you doing a criminal background check on these so-called families that you're sending these children to? No, we just really, we, we don't have the resources to do that. I'm telling you, we've got real problems, real criminality, real human suffering that is going on because of the policies of this renegade administration under Alejandro Mayorkas as the DHS secretary and a president that I think is out to lunch and simply will not listen and see what is going on, has not even been down and really done a good border a visitation in his 50 years of, of, uh, of public service. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Babbitt. It's, it's good to hear uh, positive outcomes when there is regime change in the House of Representatives. So, um, uh, and, and thank you for segueing into this next question for the chief. It's always great to have one of the panelists that uh, is reading your questions as you're, uh, before you even say it. But, but Chief Scott, I want to ask you and get a little bit b deeper in the weeds as to what's going on at the border. A lot's been made of the rising influence and effect of the cartel's operations, as Congressman Babin just said, and control of the southwest border. You and others at the foundation have commented extensively on this, and our Secure and Sovereign Texas campaign is pulling back the curtain on the political corruption um, in Mexico that's being fueled by the cartels. Can you speak specifically about the direct manipulation by the cartels of large numbers of migrants illegally crossing the southern border? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So, so yes, but I want to I want to dovetail or, or foot stomp is probably a better way uh, of something that uh, that was just said about the UACs because one of the things with this administration that that I struggle with a lot even when I was still even in is they tell a partial truth, but then when you actually pull it back and you look at the whole story, it's actually a lie even though that one piece was a truth. So they talk about the UACs. Uh, when we say UACs, those are kids that cross from any other country in the world coming to the United States without an adult with them. Border Patrol has to give them to Health and Human Services. This administration has forbidden ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, from actually working directly with HHS to vet the sponsors. And we say sponsors, that's just whoever will take the kid because they want them to get, be out of sight. The main focus of this administration was making sure that we didn't have overcrowded facilities, that you didn't see the convention centers with a bunch of kids in them. They honestly, I don't think they really cared where they went, just so America didn't see the problem. So when they say sponsor, it doesn't mean that it's a relative. That's another reason there's no DNA. They can claim their, their family. That, that's a huge risk, and I think that is basically a lie to America, how they're handling that. What's going on on the border can be a little bit the same. So we say cartels, actually in the federal government now, and I use the term cartel still because most people understand it, we actually call them transnational criminal organizations because they are global organizations that, that profit in anything they can. It's not just narcotics. It's fake goods, it's human beings, uh, it, it's narcotics as well. So here locally though, uh, when I say locally, just a little bit to our south, uh, the cartels right now today are controlling every single thing that crosses that border. So this is another little bit of a lie. This administration always tries to use the term asylum seekers. If you are truly coming to the United States on your own, think, I need you to think through something for a minute, and you were going to claim asylum, you wanted help, you wanted to find the first government official you could and surrender to them in the United States, why would you wait until 2 in the morning to cross the raging Rio Grande River? Why would you go out to Columbus, New Mexico, or somewhere in the, but even past that, where you're hours out into the desert uh, and cross with a, a group of, you know, two, three hundred of your closest friends from around the world? The reason that is happening is because the cartel scripts every crossing across that border. And it's not just to make money off those migrants. They're making money off of the, the migrants as well. And by the way, terminology, I call them migrants until they cross the border into the United States, and then by law, definition, they're illegal aliens. But the cartels use them today to make some money, but they use them as human shields. They literally have people watching every bit of the border every single day. They see how many Border Patrol agents or Texas DPS or National Guard are out deployed, and then they figure out how many aliens they need to push into the United States and where that it completely wipes out the logistics lines and the enforcement patrols that are out there so that they create huge gaps in border security and they can bring anybody willing to pay more money to be in the second wave and the narcotics or other threats into the United States right behind them. That is going on as we speak. Today, even though the numbers that are the, the crossing the border have, have dropped and the Biden administration is waving this flag that they succeeded because there's only 150,000 in a month that we're apprehended, which is just silly, even though they're waving that, the cartels are still, that's still enough that the cartels are using every single person crossing that border to shape the border. Here's what that means. 20 to 30% of Border Patrol agents today never leave the station. They're stuck still processing, feeding, or providing transport to the people that were caught in the last 12, 24 hours. But more importantly, within an hour to two hours of shift, the cartels looked at what's out there. They have, they have sources on the U.S. side as well. Corruption exists on the U.S. side as well. They figure out what's out there. They push enough across to overwhelm all of those agents. Sometimes I think I see in my head what that means, but I don't know that everybody else does. Think of two or 300 people in the middle of the desert or even standing along the Rio Grande River and then now your job is to get them from that location in the U.S. to a Border Patrol station to be processed in a van that seats 12 people. That's what I mean by wipe out the logistics. It takes hours just to get those people back to a station. Then it takes more hours to process them. If they don't speak English, you can add a couple more hours to each individual person. It wipes out all the law enforcement. The cartel knows it. And the real threats are in that second wave that we have no idea who or what it is, almost no idea. You know what we do know? 
about what crosses in the areas that, that we're not patrolling. They didn't want to get caught. They didn't surrender. And they didn't stay at the border. It's a transit location. They're going to every city, town, country, sorry, every city, town, and state in this nation, in this country. And we should all be taking this very serious because the cartel are making the decisions of who our neighbors are and where that fentanyl goes. The United States government is no longer making those decisions. And it was by policy choice when they re-implemented catch and release, it gave the cartel this endless flow of human shields. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Congressman Babin, as you know, the story of immigration reform since President Reagan signed the Immigration Reform and Control Act in 1986 has been one of, for lack of a better phrase, this is my phrase, a grand bargain. In other words, the, the idea is to pass comprehensive immigration reform that grants legal status to millions of unauthorized aliens residing in the U.S. with the promise of securing the border. Have you heard if such a grand bargain is a likelihood or a possibility in the House, or is the Republican majority's concentration on border security first indicative of a lesson learned? Now, I realize that's a leading question, but uh, appreciate it. <laughs> well, it's leading for a, for a good reason. Uh, this so-called grand bargain, uh, this uh, goes back to 1986 when Reagan was persuaded that it was wise to grant amnesty to millions of people who were here illegally and Ronald Reagan admitted that that was a mistake, that he should not have done that, and the reason being because this so-called grand bargain was not kept. We granted amnesty, and yet we did not see a border enforcement. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the Democrats, and quite frankly, some Republican administrations as well, uh, did not keep up their end of the grand bargain uh, by securing the border after the amnesty was granted. So, in the opinion of the majority of our uh, Republican conference, I can tell you that uh, we want to see a secure border before we get into any kind of, uh, of, of, of major immigration reform. Let me tell you something. John, we know, and you probably voted for some of these, we've got some good laws on the books regarding our border. They're just not being enforced. Uh, this, this Biden administration under, under Alejandro Mayorkas simply ignores the law. They're scoff laws. They really are. And as, as, we've, as we've heard from, from, uh, from the chief over here, uh, we, we have a, a, a complete just turning our backs on what's, what, what the Constitution and what the laws on the books say uh, to do. And then they will tell a partial truth uh, and, and make it look like they're doing something uh, to, to, to improve the situation when they're, they're really not. So the long and short of it is we cannot do another grand bargain. We've got to, we've got to get together and we've got to make sure that we are enforcing the laws on the books, not coming up with harebrained schemes and mincing and parsing words on humanitarian parole, illegal parole is what I call it, uh, and, and methods of, of trying to uh, make it look like uh, uh, there are not as many illegals coming across. This, this latest thing, uh, I don't know if we're going to get into that this morning, but there's, there's four countries uh, that are now uh, un, in a bargain, or if you will, or, or a deal with this administration. I think they're Venezuela, Haiti, uh, Nicaragua and um, and Cuba, uh, thirty thousand per month are going to be coming into our country legally now because they're going to legitimize these people. It's a sleight of hand operation. They don't want to see. They don't. These people are not going to be coming across, swimming across the river, or coming being rowed across the river and going up and turning themselves in anymore. They're coming in on airplanes, they're coming across on buses, already legitimized, and it makes it look like there's not as many illegals coming across, but this is the sleight of hand where you have, these people have been legitimized before they even get here. There's truly, believe it or not, there's a CBP-1 app that they can go on and start the process, right, Chief? That's correct. And that, that legitimizes them, and then they come across, and then 
Then uh, the, uh, the DHS says, see, look, we don't have as many people coming in illegally anymore. Well, quite frankly, there's still the people coming in. Uh, they have used this sleight of hand deception uh, to make it look like there's not as many people. So we're not going to fall for that trip, you know, uh, for that trick. Uh, what's the old saying, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, uh, shame on me. Uh, so I, I think it's incumbent upon us uh, as a Congress uh, to, to make sure that this grand bargain is not, uh, this deal is not worked out. And I hate to say this, but there's a number of Senate, U.S. Senators working on a deal right now in the U.S. Senate. Some of them are Republicans, folks. And there are a number of people, even in the House of Representatives, who are Republicans, working across the aisle. And I have no problem working across the aisle but we know this doesn't work. We have decades and decades of experience to show that all this does, if you grant amnesty, you just incentivize more and more and more uh, to, to, to you know, simply come in. And we, we cannot allow this to continue on because the green light, the flashing welcome sign and welcome mat has got to be turned off. And the only way to do that is to disincentivize, start deporting people who have had their day in court. This is called interior enforcement. They have greatly curtailed this under the Biden administration. Uh, it, it's, it's very difficult to be deported these days. Even if you've had your day in court, you've got to be about a double homicide uh, uh, culprit or a child molester or it's something else. But let me tell you something, you, you, if you're deported once and you come back again, Rodney, if I'm not mistaken, that's supposed to be a felony. That is a felony. Multiple entries uh, are felonies, and they have simply not been being held to account for that, and we've got to turn off that, that, that green light. Before we move to the Q&A, I just want to say thank you, because for everybody in the room, I just go back to the basics. I make it very, very simple. But any discussion about who gets to stay in the country is predicated on the concept that you control who comes in, right? So if you can't control who comes in, the entire conversation about who gets to stay or who you're gonna let in and not let in is a waste of time. So thank you for putting border security first. Yes, sir, and then one other thing, if I might, if I might add, uh, some people ask, well, why are the Democrats doing this? Why is the Biden administration wanting to open our border up? And you know, I used to think it was a philosophical thing. Folks, I think the reason is they want chaos because, as Rodney said, the more chaos they've got, the less that the human traffic, I mean, less human traffickers and druggies are being caught because Border Patrol is being pulled off the line to process people. And they want new, I've heard, we, you've heard this before, they want more voters. I think you cannot ignore that, that fact that they simply want people coming into this country and being dependent. Almost 100% of these people that come into this country, especially if they've given themselves up, are on government services. I have a school district in my own district, my own uh, congressional district, that's the third fastest growing district in the, in, in the entire state, and largely because of UACs that are coming in and we've got to make accommodations. We are required, hospitals are required to take care of illegal uh, 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 aliens. We have, to, we have to provide them with educations uh, and it, it is an enormous burden on the U.S. taxpayer. And so if they're coming in and they're already on government services, that means they have a government dependency already. And that has a tendency to have people to vote for the party that likes to have more largesse going uh, to people in this country. Uh, and uh, you know, no, no good deed goes unpunished uh, under, the, uh, under this administration, under the Democrats, uh, their far, especially their far left wing. And so, I, I, you know, you, you, you hate to say stuff like this, but I think it is for the votes. It is for a permanent majority in this country. If that's not true, then why did Washington, D.C., why has New York, why has California passed local state laws allowing people who are not citizens to vote in their local elections? Why did Mrs. Pelosi try to introduce a bill 
that would have allowed non-citizens to vote in federal elections. Thank God it was stopped in the Senate this past, uh, this past session, but just a week or two ago, Washington, D.C. passed an ordinance that would have allowed foreign nationals to vote in their elections. In our nation's capital, guess who that would include? Not just, not just illegal immigrants, not just people who are legal immigrants and not supposed to be voting as well, but embassy personnel, communist Chinese embassy personnel, Russian embassy personnel, Folks that work in the foreign embassies would be able to go down and cast their votes for what's going on in our nation's capital. And incredibly, now we got a lot of Democrats that voted with us to try to shoot this thing down, but I think it was close to, what was it, about 60, 60 some odd Democrats still voted to make that happen and did not join with us. So how can you help but think that this is not political? How can you help but think that this is for voters when you see the evidence that comes pouring out like this? I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. And we could go on for a lot longer talking, but right now we'd like to turn to you for your questions for our panelists. And do we have a microphone somewhere that's roaming around? Generally speaking, back right. Yes. Okay. Hello. Yeah, howdy, howdy, guys. My name is Dave Zinker. You know, Congressman, you know, one of the things that you just said I find very disconcerting. You said that we've got all the uh, loose kiddos and we've got all these folks that are coming in. They're being put on the dole at our expense. And you also said that this is essentially a lawless administration. So what I'm suggesting, you know, why are we complying with this stuff? This is a lawless administration that is doing stuff that is against the law. They don't care. They don't care about you, me, or Texas. So why don't we just cease complying? cease complying, especially in Texas. I mean, we've got, we've got, we should have sufficient sovereignty that we can stop our, we could, you, you guys should be helping us, Texas, build that wall and make that happen. But certainly, just certainly giving away everything to these folks just because we're told to in Washington is absurd. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> I, I could not agree more. The problem is, we have a five seat majority, you know, and I, I've had people say, well, you've got to impeach, you've got to impeach, you've got to impeach. I am absolutely, I'm, on already, I'm already on two, two impeachment bills to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas, who has lied repeatedly to us. He doesn't deserve to be where he is. He's lied under oath. He's come before our border security caucus meetings, uh, as well as these two gentlemen here. We've had a, a number of very notable peoples over the years. Uh, that have come and spoken to our border security caucus. My border uh, staffer down here is Miss Lauren uh, Ziegler. Uh, she does a tremendous job getting good folks uh, like Rodney and like John to come speak uh, to us. But we cannot tolerate what is happening. The problem is we can't, we're not gonna be able to be successful in the Senate and removing anybody from office. It is a distraction politically. There is no question about that. Can we defund? We will try to defund these programs. We will do the absolute best. This is part of what the commitment to America is, to defund some of these outlaw, I hate to call them outlaws, but by gosh, that's what they are. Uh, and, and try to defund these, uh, these uh, uh, groups. And uh, we even have uh, the Holman Rule. Uh, are you familiar with the Holman Rule? Where you can take and cut an individual's, an individual bureaucrat's salary. You can cut a program's uh, funding. We want to try to do that. The problem is we don't have the Senate. The American people are the ones that make the decision of who sits in those seats in the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House, and also in the White House and the Oval Office. So that's why it's so critical that we get this information out because of forums just like this, because of our uh, associations like TPPF and a, a, a media who does their job and functions as a fair, non-biased, 
uh, nonpartisan media to get the news and the information out to the American people. That's, the, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Can't hear. Good morning, Dave Heckert. The uh, past few years have made me think like I might be in a different country than I usually am. So I just want to get a clarification. Can anyone at the county, state, or federal level take a U.S. citizen's right of self-defense to defend their property and their lives away from them? I don't think so. I'm a dentist. I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney. I like to get to the root of problems, though, you know. But the Constitution in two different places, Article 1, Section 10, Article 4, Section 4, it says that the United States government, the federal government, will guarantee us a Republican form of government and protect us from invasion. It also says in Article 1, Section 10, that no state can work deals with foreign countries or wage war unless it is for invasion defensive purposes. I am urging, and, I, and I've had conversations with, with, with Governor Abbott, with a number of people, and Gov nobody's doing any more in this country on the state level than Governor Abbott. He has been doing a really, really fine job uh, of pushing back on this federal government. Uh, and I, I don't know whether you all have noticed or not, but people like Governor DeSantis, uh, Governor Abbott have been sending plane loads and bus loads of people uh, coming in illegally, even up to Martha's Vineyard. And I don't know whether you saw this and, and you can't help but chuckle because Martha's Vineyard went they, went, they just went ape. They had 50 illegal aliens that came into their, their, uh, uh, their community up there and they called out the National Guard. We get 50 about, what, 15 minutes? About three minutes. <laughs> exactly, we're getting about seven or 8,000 a day and that could be, that could turn, actually could turn on even more uh, with the loss of some of these, uh, uh, you know, some of these programs that Rodney had mentioned in his first segment, uh, like MPP and Title 42 and some of these other safe third countries. Um, and we, we, we've got to do something about this or we lose our country. That's, that's the long and short of it. I have a question here. Yes, uh, this is actually for the entire panel, but I'm gonna target the congressman, uh, and thank you for serving in the 118th. Um, and this is a general question. What are some conversations that the Congress is having internally right now about what to do about fentanyl specifically? It's an enormous subject. Uh, no one can ignore fentanyl anymore. Uh, you know, I, I, I used to do, I'm a, I'm a dentist. I, I used to uh, perform uh, hospital work. Fentanyl belongs in the operating room. Uh, it's an excellent synthetic opioid. That's what it is. But it has now become a street drug on a magnitude we have, we have not seen. We've, we're seeing deaths and overdoses, even in my own family. Some of my, uh, I lost, uh, one, of, one, of my, one of my cousins lost uh, his son uh, uh, to a, a drug overdose uh, uh, about four or five months ago. It hits everybody. Some, I've, I've read horrible stories where uh, a mother lost both of her sons to fentanyl overdose. Uh, we've got to do something about the fentanyl. I am, I am in favor, uh, do you all know what an AUMF is? One of my colleagues, Dan Crenshaw, former Navy SEAL, actually served with, with my son, uh, who was a Navy SEAL as well. Dan has introduced a bill uh, for an authorization for the use of military force against the drug cartels. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. It doesn't go as far as designating the cartels foreign terrorist groups, which I would like to see. The problem with that is, and I understand it 100%, that if we designate the cartels is foreign terrorist groups. Suddenly, everybody is, especially if you're in Mexico, you are living in a country that is controlled by, by a terrorist group. What does that do? It opens the floodgates at our, at our borders even more. But 
with 100,000 plus Americans being killed every year, with the deaths of literally a, a thousand, we, the ones we find, I don't know, what is it, up to a thousand people on migrants themselves, are being, their bodies have been found. A hundred terrorists on the terrorist watch list have been caught. How many have not been caught? It's time to fight back. We use drones. We use airstrikes. We use Navy SEAL teams from, uh, from uh, SEAL Team 6. We go after the ISIS. We go after Al-Qaeda. Folks, we could clean up that cartel problem in a very short order if we could use military force against them. And that's what needs to happen. It did happen, and you could probably clarify this, and you were serving at the time uh, during the Colombian uh, problem with the cartels down there when Pablo Escobar, it took U.S. military forces to go down there and to clean that operation up. It's a very sensitive subject with Mexico, though. They're very sensitive because they remember back the, the, Amer uh, the Mexican War. Uh, they don't like to see uh, military forces cross over into, that, into their country, even though it, it would absolutely be the best thing to be able to help them because obviously the, the cartels are running the show down there to a large extent. It's become a narco state. And uh, I, love, I love Mexico. We, we've, we've got some excellent Hispanic members of Congress uh, that I love serving with. And just this morning, uh, Rio Bravo, Texas, there was a fire, the fire chief in that, in that, uh, in that little town on the border said 85% of his town wants that wall built. They had a, they had a high speed chase, which wiped out uh, a car full of illegals fleeing the scene. And instead of doing the things like here, California, they're outlawing high-speed chases. So they just let them come in and, and get away. You can't do that. We've got to catch these people. People die as a result. And we cannot afford uh, to continue business as usual with these cartels. I don't know how far uh, Representative Crenshaw's bill is going to go in, in the House of Representatives, but I know that there's a bunch of us who have signed on if we're, if, we're, if we're terminating people like al Suleimani and ISIS and Baghdadi and some of these bad guys that are beheading folks, let me tell you, beheading people, that happens every single day down in Mexico and on our border. Burning people alive, raping women and children, the atrocities that are occurring down there, you don't get it on the mainstream media but it's happening, believe you me. And this man right here can verify that. I've seen rape trees before where to make an example out of someone, they rape all these children and women and hang their garments up in a tree. And uh, Rodney, isn't that right? It is right. It's, it's hideous what goes on. And I think it's important to note the reason that you don't see it reported out of Mexico, the, the, the beheadings, the, the mutilations, is because they kill the journalists. So the only true journal journalism you see coming out of Mexico is on anonymous blogs. A lot of the stuff is even on the dark net. Because in Mexico, and you guys have probably heard this, they have a saying, silver or lead. And the thing is, we kind of joke about it, but it's real down there. That it's take the bribe or take the money. So when we talk about the cartels, trying to figure out where the cartel ends and the Mexican government begins is a significant challenge. So that becomes a challenge when you just blanket decide that they're a terrorist organization. I strongly believe we need to use the same tools that we went after the terrorists with, but I think we need to stop having this one-size-fits-all terminology and changing definitions, and we need to just create legislation that specifically targets transnational criminal organizations that are killing more Americans every year than 9-11 did or most of our wars ever did, and we go at them for real, but you don't have to call them a terrorist. Just actually create legislation that lets us go after the transnational criminal organizations as named and uses the same tools. By the way, the Trump administration, and I'm not up here being political, the Trump administration got it. A big reason that Mexico stepped up to the plate in the last administration and started helping us, they started enforcing their own laws, is because as a businessman, he basically made them a business proposition. You can keep doing business as usual, and we're going to put a 25% tariff on all of your goods. So there's the, there's the silver there. 
Um, or you can play along with us, and we will try to help you minimize the impact of the cartels while you just simply enforce your own laws and help us secure the Western Hemisphere. You've got to make the business proposition in favor of the government helping us because the cartels don't operate by any freaking rules, and they have a lot of money to buy a lot of influence. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Congressman Babin and Chief Scott, for joining us today. Thank you for being a part of this. And if I can make just one shameless plug, um, some of this discussion uh, deals in what the state of Texas is doing and what other states can do. We recently published uh, uh, research here at the foundation from an aspiring researcher uh, on this topic of what states can do with regard to uh, statutory uh, language in federal laws. So there, while a lot has been said about what states can't do because of what's called preemption on the federal level, there, it, there are federal statutes that actually empower states to, to enforce some immigration law. And, and we have a paper that's available back there entitled State Authority to Execute Immigration Law Under Existing Federal Statute. You can also uh, download it from our website, uh, texaspolicy.com, all one word, texaspolicy.com. Thank you again. Thank you, gentlemen, and uh, uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.